This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Bev's Video Kingdom is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Bev's Video Kingdom really is brought to you by... What the fuck? What's up, dude? One of my renters broke the toilet again. That dude takes giant shits. Now I know what I'm doing tomorrow. Why don't you hire a property management company or something to take care of that stuff? Because they suck and they take 10%. You know, our dude Hank owns and manages Heritage Realty Partners. I think he said he only charges 5% and he visits each property at least once a month. That's right. He's always posting beers from the road. You have his number? Actually, I do. His personal number is 805-451-5734. Perfect. Now he can deal with my renter's big shits. Heritage Realty Partners. For all your property management and investment needs. This episode of Bev's Video Kingdom is brought to you by Old Tupac, the new novel from Eli Cash. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Eli Cash. Well, everyone knows that Tupac died in Las Vegas after being shot multiple times in a drive-by shooting. But what this book presupposes is maybe he didn't. <clears throat> I mean, the guy has released six albums since his death. Wow, that's a lot of albums. And he even named one Machiavelli. Machiavelli. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe it's the mescaline running through my body, but seems like enough evidence to me that Tupac is somewhere making records and living the good life. So buy my new book, Old Tupac, and find out more about one of the most unique and interesting geniuses of this or any generation. Wow. (laughs) Damn, the accent is not bad that the content a- is a plus, plus. <laughs> maybe it's the mescaline running through my body <laughs> I want to be at Beverly's bringing me home What is up, BVK? Uh, guys, this is just really weird because you know what? I'm only like two drinks in because this is a, kind of a, a first time ever. BVK in the morning. We got people eating breakfast burritos and shit. Like, I don't know what's going on here. I feel like we should make a make like a, 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 a canned mimosa called BVK in the morning. <laughs> BVK yeah. in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, uh, it's it's kind of wild. I don't think we've ever really done this. Fuck it. I'm, people are drinking crack. cokes, eating breakfast. God damn it, Brad! I was trying to make it sound like it was a beer. Yeah, I'm gonna lie. I'm I'm not gonna lie. I don't lie. I'm a very honest person. Um, yeah, this is hey. like a really what what could have been type deal where it's like we could have been AM radio DJs, right? Like we we could have done that. But instead, we'll just while away on a podcast network that no one listens to. I love it. And that wacky voice is Zach. He's in the uh, quarantine <laughs> chambers right now. He's not joining us because he is sick as a dog. He's been shitting himself for about three weeks. All right. <laughs> I can't even participate in this. I'm so averse <laughs> to the DJ voice. Oh, DJ voice. Uh, yeah, Zach is. Uh, uh, he he's he's here. He's uh, uh, the disembodied voice, but he is uh, on Zoom. We are looking at him, and he looks really bad. Really bad. I don't know what those yeah, those like. It's really bad. I hate you guys. Oozing blisters are are not great. The uh, tip of his nose looks like it's you know a little crusty. Crusty. Yeah. It kind of looks like uh, kind of that leprosy kind of look to him. I, I was thinking it was more like Andy Reid's mustache from the oh, the, yeah. the Chiefs game. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the icicle snow. icicle stash. I love that. Oh yeah, he's sitting Thanks, on guys. a he's sitting on a toilet too. I was like, okay, well, yeah. fuck it, you can zoom. Somehow the, the, the wall behind him is just like splattered with it's, God. <laughs> it's spackled. Is that a background? Blood That's is that okay. real or is that oh, okay? It's All blood right. splatter, dude. It, it did come out of my butt, but it is blood. Mm, okay. All right, so yeah, let's let's get let's get off the toilet here and and start talking about a movie because we are here to talk about a movie and it's our our first uh, 
I would say official movie pod because we did Jackass a couple weeks ago and and Jackass is is I mean borderline movie. It's not necessarily a movie with plot and uh, yeah. my my dad hated it. The YouTube. Oh, movie. your dad watched it? Uh, I don't actually don't know that he watched the whole thing, but he was just like he thought the choice was just horrific. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. He, he was he was yeah. he was he was def- he was loud. There's so definitely a this. generation above <laughs> us that that, that it, it doesn't make sense to them. They're like, oh, yeah. I don't get why people would do exactly. this or or why it would happen and. Yeah. I don't know. It's definitely a generational thing. I, I was would, on I the verge assume. of that myself. I'll be honest, but I'm well. Yeah, pretty, but, you're well, pretty old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Well, well, yeah, we, we, you know what? We we can make jokes without you just giving us the layups. Okay, right, we, well, you don't just have wait. To. This this isn't over yet. Zach, <laughs> has Wendy watched Jackass? Zach, I believe she did not watch it. I think she really? had a very similar reaction to uh, Keith's reaction, and probably didn't. <laughs> That's oh weird. yeah, well, I mean, you know what? It's funny. Like my dad, he 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 doesn't like the cuss words and stuff. But I think he he laughed at, at some scenes. But he he definitely, I mean, some of it's uncomfortable. But I think he actually has watched some of it and 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 definitely had some laughs. He really liked Wild Boys of all things. He really liked. Okay, who was it? That's uh Stevo and and Pontius out there. He that's he really dug that show. All right, so we are here to talk about. The movie we I don't have we done Wes and this is our first Wes Anderson, first Wes Anderson. Wes, yeah. we've done a lot of episodes folks and this is our first Wes Anderson movie and and we decided to do the Royal Tenenbaums the Royal Tenenbaums from two thousand one one two thousand one so uh, this is a a classic for me it is my favorite Wes Anderson movie and and I'll talk about my feelings okay. of Wes Anderson a little bit later but. Uh, Wes Anderson directs this. Uh, he also wrote it with Owen Wilson. He and Owen Wilson wrote mm-hmm. this movie together. Uh, Twenty-one million budget, and it grosses seventy-one million, so it, it does well. Um, I think it is one of the the better profits that uh, Owen Wilson made. I mean, excuse me, that Wes Anderson made. I for, think it's second this movie. on on the, on the list of, of the movies that he's done. I think uh, Grand Budapest was his the the highest, most profitable. Or his uh, most profitable. I mean, okay. this one when you so this is his second major movie, right? Like like in terms of. Yeah, because so Rush, Rushmore, Rushmore was kind of his, his big, breakout. like his big breakout. Uh, Bottle Rocket before that, a lot of people consider like his his really his kind of like first major movie. That's but I mean, Rush, but I mean this one like in some ways like the cast. Show, so like in the you know he has Bill Murray and but, but Jason Schwartzman who's the star of Rushmore is not huge, right? I mean, he's he not was big totally at that, unknown at that unknown time. at that yeah. time. Yeah, um, Bill Murray obviously is big, but it's like that's his big get. And so, like, if you think about the transition from Rushmore to Tannenbaum's in terms of, like... Star power? Star power. Yeah. And in terms of what, clearly, like, Rushmore comes out after Bottle Rocket, and it's like he got the door open, but it wasn't like the people were anticipating Rushmore. Royal Tannenbaum's people were, like, waiting for. You know, I mean, it was like, you know, people saw it coming. I remember. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I was a huge Rushmore fan, so I remember watching. I mean, I was I was really excited to see Royal Tannenbaum's when it came out. And I think it's actors now realizing, oh, this guy's talented. I want to be a part, I want to be of, a part of it as yeah. well. Yeah. And, he, oh, yeah. and he starts to build. I mean, he already had the community of the of the Wilson brothers, but um, he he starts to build in, bring in some some other talents as well. And so because because he went to school with with Owen Wilson, they were, they met in college, I believe. I think that's right. Yeah, so, and that's kind of what started their their whole partnership and and doing movies together. And so that's you know, Bottle Rocket. Have you guys seen Bottle Rocket? I have. I have. I watched okay. a long time ago, and I really could remember nothing of it, except it was a little bit darker than I thought it was supposed to uh-huh. be. Like because I was thinking like more whimsical and fun, and it, right. it's got a little dark side to I've it. I've never seen it, but yeah. But so it, it's just kind of cool that they 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 have this friendship, and, and it's kind of it's always neat to hear about guys coming up together and kind of yeah. building yeah. each other I love up. That and, too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I I know I did not see this in the theater. This is one I saw uh, later on, both Rushmore. I remember seeing the preview for Rushmore, and I don't know why, but there was a, a scene in the preview. It's when Owen Wilson, I'm sorry, uh, Luke Wilson is the uh, the surgeon that's dating the teacher, <laughs> that's right. and they take uh, uh, Schwartzman to dinner. And then he's like, these are OR scrubs. And when he just is like, he's kind of oh, drunk and he's like, they? oh, are they? Oh, are they? <laughs> and I just Which remember thinking that great, was, it was great, such a so funny, funny, funny line in that trailer. And it made me want to watch it, but I never watched it at the theater. And then I saw Rushmore and I was like, okay, this is, this is pretty neat. This is cool. Yeah. Bill Murray just really acting his ass off and, and, and being awesome in that movie. And then you get ton of Tenenbaums, which I didn't go to the theater, but I remember watching it home the first time and it was just like, damn, this isn't, is really good. Isn't Schwartzman related? To, isn't he like, Coppola's nephew or something. I, 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 I he's uh, somebody Sophia Coppola's something or something along those lines. But yeah, they're related. They're related. So, but okay. but but I'd always remember hearing the story about how how he got that part. He showed up to some party wearing that 
jacket like he 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 put the patch on this jacket and showed up like almost in character at this party and that kind of like sealed the deal on him getting that part oh that's pretty cool yeah that's pretty cool so um tenenbaums it has something that i love in a movie which is a grumpy old man anytime you've got like <laughs> like an old guy that's kind of just bitter and kind of mean i don't know why when when actors really get into that type of role i really dig it mm-hmm. um but i guess Gene Hackman, allegedly, when he was going to uh, take on this movie, he was a little concerned that he's been kind of an asshole most of his life and was a little bit worried that it was going to be kind of like he's playing that exact role and he thought that it would be kind of like uh, uh, that, that people who he's wronged would feel some way like, oh, yeah, look at this asshole playing himself. And and so he kind of was hoping that his family would be OK with him uh, doing this. And, and his family was like, yeah, you're, it's OK. Don't worry. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, Hackman, there's some there's some good stories well, about Hackman and, and Wes Anderson. Well, I was going to say, you know, this is jives with our, because we had uh, uh, David Anspaugh on, right, who directed Hoosiers, and he had a lot of Hackman stories right. that I think yeah. added up to Gene Hackman as an asshole. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. You know, and, and in some of the ways that, like, you could imagine, you know, like the Tannen, the Royal Tannenbaum is not, you know, dissimilar to the actor that, that uh, Anspaugh described. It is, it is pretty crazy, though, because, I mean, based on, two films before this Hackman signing on to a role like this and just all the like Angelica Houston, Danny Glover, this amazing cast. It's pretty amazing how the, kind of a, an up and coming director at the time, he wasn't huge yet and they were all in and, and it just kind of shows you how strong the, the screenplay was and, and, and everything like that. It just, it, it's pretty cool to, to see that kind of star power saying, yeah, to somebody kind of still working his way up well rushmore wasn't necessarily a a popular hit it was definitely it was critically a game like critics were going crazy about it like oh my gosh this is an amazing future filmmaker here and 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 this is his big breakout so i think that it was definitely within hollywood this is the guy that you want to be attached to because because he he's going to be doing some big things so let me ask you that well yeah i'm gonna wait till the well yeah i want want to get to to your take so when we when we put this movie out there was a few people like i haven't seen it i'm not sure how i feel about it i want to i want to get some feelings from uh zach you you i know you said you didn't have a great relationship with this movie prior to us choosing it so what are your thoughts now on on a rewatch so i just want to say that like bottle rocket was a movie that i rented at bev's video kingdom Oh, nice. And brought home on, on VHS and watched and liked. It was weird. It was different. It wasn't as weird as Rushmore or Tenenbaum. And then when Rushmore came out, I dug it. I actually bought it on VHS and really dug it. So I think there was a lot of anticipation. I think that, like, there's sort of a, like, at the time, there was this big buzz around Wes Anderson and sort of, like, filmmaker, like, wannabe filmmaker, wannabe, like, film studies guys that were like, this guy's the most amazing which uh, probably led to him getting all these actors and actresses in Tenenbaum. But I was jazzed for Tenenbaum and I saw it in the theater and I remember being very disappointed. Now, fast forward however many years later, I haven't watched it since because I didn't dig it. I actually thought it was really boring. Um, And I watched it last night uh, by myself, just out in the living room, straight through, not like Nate style, not episodes or anything. And I absolutely uh, really liked it. I really liked the music. I really liked a lot of the things about it, the sort of like the character arc of uh, the dad and, you know, all the, all the actors sort of have a, all the characters sort of have this like cool arc where they kind of come together at the end, which I, which I really dug. And I, uh, I liked it. I think it tries too hard in my opinion, a lot. Um, some of it seems a little try hard to me, but I mean, for what it is, I mean, it's, I guess if it was another person that released this movie, I would be like, this is the most try hard Wes Anderson shit ever. But uh, I feel like Rushmore was a little toned down on the quirky Wes Anderson stuff that I think now has kind of gotten out of control. But that's that's my take. It's interesting that you 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 like it now because of all directors and all all movies from a director. I think his movies get better with every watch, and every movie of his is like that for me. Every time I watch it the first time, one of his movies, I'm like, hmm, you know, whatever, it's good. I kind of like it or whatever. But I always am wanting to go back and watch it again. And every time I watch it again, it gets better and better. You pick up more of the, the nuance, the jokes. And that I, I also did not love this movie the first time I watched it. I'd seen Rushmore. That one hit a lot. A lot. The first watch, I did like it a lot more. Every watch has gotten better and better on that one. But this one I was excited about. 
I think I bought it before I even saw it. I just go, hey, it's going to be great. Didn't love it the first watch. But then something made me go back to it and go back to it and go back to it. And now I, I really enjoy it. There's so many little things that you notice that are, that are great. So so I've it's interesting. I have like almost exactly the opposite reaction. Okay. Um, or I should say a, a, a very a very opposing parallel, which is that I loved Rushmore. Like I remember seeing it and absolutely – thinking it was revolutionarily good and I've only seen it one time. Huh. And I'm somebody that rewatches movies. I mm -hmm. I mean my favorite movies I've seen dozens and dozens of times. And I remember seeing anticipating Royal Tenenbaums, seeing it in the theater and really liking it. I think I remember thinking, okay, this is not Rushmore. It's not as good for me as Rushmore. And I think along the lines that Zach's saying, right? Like I wouldn't have put it this way, but it was like it, it, it dialed up the like subtle things mm -hmm. that, that were different about Rushmore to like an 11 mm -hmm. and then, you know, or maybe not an 11, maybe an eight because my sense is, and, and I will, I, I think I've seen a portion of Darjeeling limited and I don't think I've seen any other since Wes Anderson. Wow. Okay. And so here, but here's my sort of take, which is that like, it's a movie that I loved like Rushmore and I really liked Royal Tenenbaums, but, for some reason, they feel jarring to watch. I'll just piggyback that, Nate. Like, you're right. He's at like a five in Rushmore. He goes to like a seven in this. And then you get into like the life aquatic type movies and stuff. Yep. He's at like a 14. And you're like, this is too much. Like, it's too fucking kooky for just and, to be kooky. And I think I did see, like well, you say, I think I did see life aquatic. And that was the thing that I was like, I can't do this. And so I think it turned yep. me off. Which is crazy because that, that's one of my favorites. Okay. I think, it, I think life oh, really? aquatic is my favorite. I, well, Grand Budapest actually is probably. So I've better. heard the Grand Grand Budapest is the best. It's fantastic, of them, and I haven't seen it's it. It's fantastic. So this this actually made me want to go back and run through the like the Wes Andersons I haven't seen because right. I, I I think I probably agree with your take, which is if I can get myself to watch them again and again, I'm probably going to really love them. Yeah, and I would say you know, and this is sort of a little bit different than Zach and Brad on this front, but like I don't tend in general to give movies a lot of extra points just because they're really novel, right? Whereas I think both you and Zach, Brad, like are, are tend to like the, the newness and differentness of it strikes you in a way that's really important. And for yeah, me, for sure, at least it's not like on the surface and I'm not aware of it. There probably are ways in which that's important. And this, this is one that I, in some ways might even like, I might have downgraded a little bit because it feels like it's trying to be different too much, except it's just so good. Like he's just so talented mm -hmm. and, and in a way that's like hard to describe and not only talented in a way that's hard to describe, there's no one else that does a good job mimicking it. Right. When you think about other, other directors that did things that were really good, a lot of that stuff gets, I mean, you think about Scorsese, right? Like you have these like very well-known things that he does that get picked up and adapted by other directors I don't think anyone even does a good copy or even a close copy of Wes Anderson. For some reason, I always have like the, the Coen brothers come to mind in the sense that they are quirky and weird and, and their movies all kind of have a similar feel. That's probably the closest, them, but they're definitely not the same. Like they're de especially color wise and, and the way they're shot. Like there's, there's definitely a, a structure that Wes Anderson has. I mean, for me, it's all that I would say like it's, it's editing, right? Like yeah. the editing in Wes Anderson films, is so different than anything else um, that I, I just, but it's also, it's also the colors. It's the weird, like the weird colors, the weird, like cards, like, that, like kind of like separate the scenes, uh, a movie that like, maybe I want to know your, y'all's take on it. Like that when I think of Wes Anderson sort of knockoffs that I really liked, I think of uh, Napoleon dynamite. That seems Wes Anderson. That's not a bad me, comparison. Not, yeah, Jared, Jared has like, is that, movies. Yeah. That's actually probably the best copy of it. I mean, or I should yeah. say best, like, you know, most correctly and well, you know, executed influenced. And they both, and they both have very interesting, like ca characters, some of their faces, like some of the actors they choose for these small parts have very distinct, weird, interesting looks to them. They almost oh, yeah. they're, like the, some of these characters in these movies are almost like set pieces, well, you know, like, like the old farmer and Napoleon dynamite like that. You know. I'll, 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 I have some like, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on that comment in the director section. I specifically did not choose this for streaming recommendations because it's just been played out, but a movie that definitely has the Wes Anderson kind of feel is Amelie. 
and it's it's yeah. it's kind of the French version, um, both in color, line delivery, quirky characters, um, and it's it's definitely got a little bit of that vibe too. I, and I it's def- a cartoon though, right? Oh my. <laughs> by Pixar. <laughs> um, I, at this point, I think we should shout out the cinematographer for all of these films. Is a guy named Robert Yeoman, and so he he's he's the guy that Wes Anderson uses for all his movies, which obviously that has. A huge implication. It's a yeah. huge part of it. So that's brain. why these films have this certain look, and 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 so uh, yeah, those are those are the guys you don't really talk about much are cinematographers, and and they're kind of the unsung heroes of all these movies. It's because we're not a cinephile pod, okay, Scott? I forgot that. <laughs> dude, I'm Shut not up, either, Scott. Dude, I'm on Wikipedia right now, dude. It's not like I know this shit. <laughs> Oh, man. I, 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 we should, we should, I got, we got to talk to the director. We're, we're, we're so deep. We're in so deep. All right. It's time to bring the director out. Let's go. Pull up a chair and grab yourself a drink. Hypothesize what directors think. Maybe sometimes get a guess. Makes us look good. Let's drink, laugh, and pretend we know what we're doing. Drinking with the director brought to you. And just a big surprise today, folks, right off the bat, 2024, if we had connections to Wes Anderson, he would be here on the pod with us, but he's not. So (laughs) just so you know, if you have any connections to actual directors, actors, people that have starred in some amazing cinema, you know, send them our way, give them our email address, Uh, hook them up with our our Instagram and our socials so that we can, uh, you know, be a part of this. So before we get anywhere, um, last call brewing, we got something exciting coming up this week, folks. In just four short days or three short days, however you count, I don't know. Does today count? Well, it depends on when they're know. listening. However you count, <laughs> I don't know how you count days. I never do. Do you say like would 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 if it's Tuesday and then Friday is it? So it'd be one, two, three, three four days. days, or is do, it? Do three you days? count Tuesday or do you start I, on Wednesday? I think th- I always I always do it as like three days because like it's three twenty four hour periods from now is the day of. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, Friday, <laughs> June. June, January 26th, <laughs> January 26th, Friday, uh, around 5 p.m. We are going to be at Last Call Tap Room in Oakdale, California on First Street and the delicious third iteration BVK IPA 3 Draft Day is going to be on tap and in cans for your drinking pleasure. Uh, there's going to be music by Scotch Becks. Uh, Scotch Becks. <laughs> Multiple Scotch Becks are going to show up. We cloned them, and there's going to be a few of him. Uh, you've got Nate and 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 Zach might be, uh, you know, I want Zach to play some stuff. Who knows? We have to talk about that. One. Oh, I guess as I mean, talked about so got, shit. Only got two, yeah, three, got four days. Two or three or four days, and then um, you, there's going to be a, a food truck to fork in the road. They've got some delicious eats for us, and it's going to be a party. We've done this multiple times. Uh, there'll be probably some games and maybe some prizes to win. Um, all sorts of goodies going on. Please get your booties down to Last Call Brewing on January 26th. Friday. Get your booties down there. Get the booties. I like how we, we go real like light language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought you said boobies. I thought you said get your boobies down there. I was excited. Uh, boobies, booties, there. buttholes, whatever we got, there bring them down now there. Now we're talking. Let's all get down uh, there and have some fun and, and you know, get lubed up. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Way to come back. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, real quick, uh, one other little surprise about today, even though we don't have Wes Anderson here, is that, you know what, I don't think we've ever done this before, but BBK is, we're recording here in the morning. Right. And so, you know, I'm only like two beers deep, uh, considering it's like 930 right now. And uh, I see my, my other co-host here drinking uh, Coke Zeros. I'm probably eight <laughs> Coke Zeros deep. Yeah, that's yeah, true. That's no joke. That is, that's, that's typical for, for 930 in the morning. Uh, Zach is drinking Pedialyte and uh, Gatorade. I literally have a Pedialyte right here. No. Literally Pedialyte. <laughs> <laughs> it's Pedialyte Plus. Actually, it, it actually has little booze in it, so it's kind of cool. It's Gator Light. It's Gatorade's Pedialyte. It's, okay. Uh, really tastes really salty, but I guess that's the point. It's that's a little... A, uh, I don't it's got electrolytes. Being honest. Well, we're going to be doing yeah. lots of drinking at, at the release, so I think it's probably good that we take it. You literally are drinking Yeah, beer, Wal- though, Walter would be mad at me because I'm drinking a uh, Operation Nectaron, which is pretty old. Um, it was canned quite a bit ago, uh, but yeah, 
Um, sorry, Walter. I'm enjoying. It was in Scotch, Scotch's fridge, and so I just drank it. Wait till I drink the BVK IPA number one that's still in that fridge. Oh yeah, we might oh. bring those. And and folks, don't forget. And I hope he hasn't forgotten. But there might be, uh, you know, some special event happening with Nate's toes. God, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot. I said that. I mean, you were pretty adamant well, about it. I'm so confused. Son of a... <sighs> Nate suggesting that we could go ahead and do the old, uh, you know... The, uh, the jackass. The paper, paper, cut. paper paper cut, cut between on, my toes. Between the toenails. And he said... Oh. Both Not with toenails between my toes. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> between your big toe God. and your in your second toe, you said we could do both sides. Yeah. I, and and I'm, it was... But $200. So, folks, we might be asking for some donations. $200. I'm going to put in... Bucks. <sighs> are, are you really... Are you, you going to get I'm divorced not. if you do this? I want no part of this. Why would I get divorced? She doesn't... She's going to She's gonna be like, you're an idiot. And you think she, she'll she just sit I there and watch Nate, this? Well, I, I don't I know. I, she, I don't want to hear him complaining. But I will say that she, <laughs> this morning, she was opening some sort of box, cardboard box, and she got a deep, bad... Th- cardboard box paper cut underneath her fingernail Ah. and like she's like she is she's a tough woman like she's not she is not somebody who like you know handles physical discomfort poorly and it she i I, it's the most prolonged pain i've seen her in in a while so so on on friday you're gonna get up there in the booth and take your your shoes and socks off and you're gonna be like let me show you how it's done i I think she'll be more offended by me taking my shoes and socks off in public than (laughs) The, the, you better clip those toenails and you know scrub the, the toesies a little bit so that we're we're ready to go uh, um i'll do my best I, I i folks i'm hoping this happens just you better be there to find out if it does because I, I in fact i have a, a affliction with dry paper but i will cut the fuck out of his is is whatever <laughs> I can't you call that you're the gonna, yeah, you can't do it oh i'll totally do it i i think i can wait wait wait, wait. can this we be overcoming can fears we what is what does you having an affliction with dry paper mean? I am so confused yeah, by that statement. You, weren't you on the pod when we were talking? You probably just weren't listening to me. That's right. No, no, I just I don't like dry, dry like, paper. Like my, if I think about like you know my tongue on dry paper, like an envelope. If I'm looking at an envelope and I get beyond like the little glue part and I touch the dry paper, it it really it, it really I have. So you're a, saying like if we want to haze you, we should just like wad up some printer paper and shove it in your mouth. It's yeah. I mean, I, if I can get enough saliva going that I don't think about it, but if I like, if it's my like tongue, like a popsicle stick, oh my God, that's nightmare for me. I bite at the end of the popsicle when I get down to the bottom, like I have to bite the ice cream off or whatever, because I do not want my tongue to touch the popsicle stick. Uh, my, it's, I have a similar thing. Like it makes that, me just fucking freak out. You know, I don't like, know why. You know, the egg crate material, the, okay. the idea of biting that is like horrific to me. Like, like putting my teeth on. You guys that. are so fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're, we're, are we talking to a director? Yeah, so uh, that's the last couple. And, and real quick, we are uh, Deluxe Edition Network, BBK. We are the podcast of the year and also the podcast of the month along with... No, we're not. Oh, yeah, we are. We are the along with our friends from the Bar- <laughs> Barrel Aged Flicks. Um, they are a great movie podcast that involves a lot of drinking. They do shots. They do. Uh, uh, they, they usually have a drink of the, of the movie, and uh, they drink a lot, and sometimes they puke, and they talk, and they laugh, <laughs> and they have a good time. And they've got an awesome studio, so you can actually check out some of the pictures on the socials and stuff. They've got a badass studio. Not that the Scotch's Cantina is anything to, uh, uh, to but be we don't sad really about. Take but pictures and show people of it. So yeah, we, no, we don't. There's just guitars and 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 shit all over the place and a drum set right next to us, which I've dropped my balls on a few times secretly. Ooh. Son of a bitch, I knew it. <laughs> all right, so enough of that. Hey, Nate, you want to talk about the director? So uh, what I what I was you know sort of thinking about when I when Scott said his made his comment earlier. Was I, I want to? I've been puzzling over how, like, I would describe what the what Wes Anderson films are, and in particular, Tannenbaum's, and, oh, cool. and maybe more so some of the later ones. So, so most movies, right? I'd say you know ninety nine percent. The idea is that you're supposed to be have a perspective, right, as the audience of what you're supposed to believe is like real life. You know what I mean? Like the camera is supposed to be the, you know, interacting with the real world um, in a, a story that you're you know being put into by the camera, right? Like that, you know, they want you to suspend disbelief and believe that it is all real. It's clear that none of the, you know, like none of the Wes Anderson movies want, want that, right? It's like, no one thinks that, you know, the, the coloring, the, um, the way that it, you know, the editing works, the camera angles, the characters, right? The way they, perform the way that they're dressed, the way that their hair is, 
it's all, it, none of it is supposed to make you think that you're watching something play out for real. Right. And so I'm trying to decide like, what is he going for? Right. What, so I've, I've come up with two potential, you know, sort of characterizations that I would be curious, you know, his take on one is this is the movie equivalent of a caricature, right? Like mm -hmm. you go, you, you know, you walk at like down, a, down, a, in, you know, in a, in a carnival or whatever, and they will draw your face, except they expand, you know, they like exaggerate all your features. So like, he's sort of like t allowing you to walk through a world of caricature, right? The, the, the sets are caricatures, the, the, you know, costumes are characters, the acting and performances are characters. Even the script is a caricature. So yeah. like all Gene those Hackman being a dick the whole time is like, so over the top, over the top, like, right? He could do a movie where he's being a dick, but he's never going to be as big a dick as he is yeah. in this movie. Cause it's a character of caricature of that, like stereotype right right so 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 i it's almost like a i would i there are a handful and, and i think the the napoleon dynamite comparison is a good one like there are some movies if you think about it that all have this intention they're they're not quite as out there obvious but i do think there's like what you could call a very like niche caricature genre the other way you might think about it is like this is essentially a three-dimensional theater performance right? Like stage performance, right? Like yes. you can imagine that, that this is the way, I mean, even like the way that scenes change, right? You could imagine somebody walking out, you know, onto the, you know, there and, and holding up, you know, like a, a card or something to like help you. Well, people transition. move some furniture around and get the next scenes. So right. Yeah. It's and, definitely, definitely got a play and, feel to it. And I think that those, you know, one or one of those two, or maybe the combination of the two, for me is what really distinguishes like that's how that's how I see that movie as Wes Anderson right is that it's sort of holistically is is like something like that but I, I would be very curious to see you know what his take on all those is I, the one thing about Wes Anderson for me is is and I found myself I was just looking at his IMDb and I'm looking at his he's got an upcoming uh, movie called the uh, Phoenician scheme and right now just only it's pre-production. There's only three people in the cast: Benicio del Toro, Michael Sarah, Bill Murray. I'm immediately like, "Fuck, I'm in." Oh yeah. But if you looked at the cast for his last movie, Asteroid City, fucking amazing cast. Right. And and I watched that, and I was just like, it was very Wes Anderson, but it was almost like just too Wes Anderson. It was just like I felt like nothing happened, and I was just like, okay, this is a little bit weird. Oh, okay, this is even a little bit weirder now, but. Ultimately, it just didn't have me feeling anything. I was like, okay, these are performances that are objectively good performances, but they just didn't make me feel anything. Like, it didn't make me really laugh too much. It didn't really make me like, I mean, there was no really dramatic elements that really had me going. Um, and I don't know. It was just kind of like I finished well, watching I think, it and I was like, okay, well, that was a that was a movie, like, like Zach always says. I think Nate is like hitting it on the head when he says that it's like a play because there's something inherent to, well, first in Rushmore and in this movie, like plays is a big part of it. Like there's a big like plot point as, along with like stage plays. But I think that unless you're like a super serious, like stage actor, like Clippy, you're, you're, you're finding yourself in a situation where in order to get your point across, you sort of have to be a caricature because you don't have the tight camera angles and you don't have those things. And you're sort of forced into this world of like, you've got to be bigger than life in order for the audience to understand what you're trying to get across. Right. So I think that's sort of what he's doing in a movie. Yeah, I, I get that. And, and that's the weird thing is that you would think, I mean, if you hear the, the, from Asteroid City, Scarlett Johansson, Jason Schwartzman, Tom Hanks, Jeffrey Wright, Brian Cranston, Edward Norton, uh, uh, Maya Hawk, uh, Lee, Lee Schreiber. Like, you're just like, holy fuck, yeah. this should, this That's should crazy. work. This when, should be everybody. When I saw the trailer, I was like, holy shit, they're in it. They're in it. That's look, this looks amazing. And then I heard the reviews on it and then I was like, I kind of lost interest. So and but, now you're saying it wasn't that great either. So I have, really don't want to watch it. But strange enough, he's done some shorts on Netflix just recently. Uh huh. And like the first one, the wonderful story of Henry Sugar. I really enjoyed it. it. Was it was a little short movie, and uh, it, it was the right amount of Wes Anderson, a little quirky. Uh, it was Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, Ralph Fiennes, and uh, uh, Dev Patel, Ben King Kingsley. So, I mean, again, wow. some some pretty big names, yeah. and it it was a fun little short. I enjoyed it, but Asteroid City did nothing for me. So, I don't know mm -hmm. if it's just like sometimes he's hitting the right emotional notes, right, and it's entertaining, and other times it's just kind of like almost going through the motions. Yeah, and I don't know. Well, I mean, it's also, you know, to this point, movies, right? Film, films and movies, right? Which are, you know, I guess the same thing. But like, if you were going to be sort of nitpicky about it, 
there are, it's a form of art and it's a form of entertainment and those things often overlap, but not always in a sense, right? Like a lot of movies are made for people that are not interested in experiencing or evaluating the artistic element of it. They want to escape. They want to be entertained. They want to, you know, even feel things right. But they, and so inherently there might be sort of what, what the producer of it, the director of it, the actors in it feel like is their art. But at the end of the day, most of the people that are consuming it are not consuming it that way, right? In theater is very different, right? Like I would say most people that go to theater are people that are sort of more self-aware about them consuming what is a form of art, right? Wes Anderson, in a sense, right, is is unflinchingly doing art through film and sort of Absolutely. seems unconcerned about whether or not you find it entertaining. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, and I guess you know, part of it is that like, because it is itself also because his art happens to be in some cases, very entertaining. It might draw a slightly bigger audience that then has expectations of his other art that it also be entertaining. But I think some of what happens with Wes Anderson is he's just like, and this, this gets to the point about why when you go from Rushmore to Tannenbaum's, you get this like incredible cast growth. And as you said, right, Rushmore was critically acclaimed, but not a huge success. This is an opportunity, I think, for a lot of these actors to do something very different from an artistic standpoint and be like, I, I'm, I'm in a lot of movies that make me a lot of money and entertain people, but I want to have a chance on film to do something that is un, right. like sort of unflinchingly artistic in a way that's totally new, totally free. You know, so I don't know. I, I, I have that feel with him um, and I'm not a big like, you know. I mean, I like to be entertained by movies, so I'm not, I'm not one of these people that tends to evaluate it as an art, 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 you know, as primarily art in terms of the way I think about it. But I respect the fact that he's able to walk that line enough to get money and a cast. That's great. But also be like, fuck you. I don't care whether or not you like it. I want to, yeah. I want to do a wild analogy that both cinephiles and uh, music lovers will hate. Um, I, I, there's it just, this just came to me and I was thinking about it. There's uh, a band 311 who's been playing music for a long time and they have a very, they are in a very specific, like their music is 311. And when you hear 311 song, you're like, this is definitely 311. And they put out some, what I consider some pretty awesome albums early on and stuff. Yeah, and they're pretty some, popular some, some for hits and popularity. They're still making albums. You can go to their disc discography. They put out an album about every couple of years and you'll hear it and you're like, yeah, that's 311. And every once in a while there'll be a song that's, oh, that's that's a little rocker. That's that's pretty solid. But it's one of those things that I I, I do, I'm, I would consider myself a fan of them, but I'm not going out of the way to listen to some of their new stuff. I'm just like, you know, yeah, it's 311. It's it's still there and, it's, and they're still doing what they love to do. And obviously they don't give a fuck about anybody else they're just like we're gonna make the music we want to make and uh and we're gonna continue playing and they still have a pretty good following at the same time wes anderson's like that he's still making movies and some of them i'm just like oh yeah that's very wes anderson but yet he doesn't care like he's and, just like that's what i'm gonna do and despite a lot of them not being huge box office successes to your point about asteroid city right scott i mean mm -hmm. the cast is better than ever right yeah the cast is better than ever and it's and, and he's not making more and more money with every film. Yeah, but what's interesting, I, I just looked it up and I was curious about who wrote, you know, because what makes, you know, Ten of Bombs, what gives it its its amazing like maybe the feeling and some of the comedy. It's like he co-wrote that with with Owen Wilson. Mm -hmm. Asteroid City was all him. It looks like it was written and directed by him. And so maybe it was just like his. He just wanted to make this art piece. He had something to say or whatever. Yeah. And maybe that's why it didn't hit because maybe he didn't really develop these characters because he just had this vision of something he wanted to create or something. Maybe right. that's why it didn't quite work. Can I, can I make a confession right now real quick? Please. <clears throat> I really haven't heard much of what you guys have said the last few minutes. Because you, ever, you ever see like um, beans growing up a stalk and like there's little tendrils that go out and wrap around things? Mm -hmm. You ever seen a little thing? Yeah. I think Brad's hair is alive because he's got this little curly hanging down on his brow. <laughs> And it's wrapped around his string on his sweatshirt, and it's fucking oh, in my God. head now. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait. So somebody, I got to take, take a picture of this. Yeah, I didn't realize it was it's happening. It's freaking me out, man. My hair does have a mind of its own. It, it, it legit, when I get out of the shower, and if it starts to dry, you can legit seeing it like move in real life. Like in real time, you can see it start to move yeah. and curl and it's, it's kind of it, freaky. It's wrapped around his thing and it's just, yeah, it's the weird, it's that's the one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for that tangent, but fuck, I had to say something. Uh, you, know what's weird, you know what's weird about that? You know what's weird? So when you started saying that, I was looking at the other one, which has been threatening to wrap around his, his headphone, headphone cord. cord. <laughs> and I've caught that a few times and went, is that going to happen? 
Are we headed there? Guys, I, I, I have a confession. <laughs> I've slowly been, you know, just trying to concentrate on being able to like use my hair as weapons. And so pretty soon I'll be it's, able to like yeah. pick up forks with it. And, you know, like it'll be like it's kind of like extra superhero hands. level. Yeah. Yeah. Horrifying. I've been trying using a lot of mental power to try to control those braids for right. sure. Sorry for that tangent. I, okay. I love so, it. It's back, worth it. Um, Wes, Wes, the one thing I would want to ask him about is this whole relationship with Gene Hackman because Wes yeah. Anderson says, and he said in interviews, one of his negative points of his career is that he feels like he could not keep Gene Hackman happy on the set of Royal Tenenbaums. And, and it, to me, I would like to ask him, like, why do you give a fuck about trying to make him feel good if he has completely shown himself to be an asshole throughout many, many, many film sets? And with uh, relationships with a lot of people, he's right. he's broken because he's been such a jerk. So, it, like, it, why a, do you feel like you wanted to? What you think you're going to be the one to fix him? It's amazing how you how often you hear about this from Gene Hackman and how many fucking amazing mov movies he's in and the performances he puts on and and his his fellow castmates in all these movies, like the chemistry between these characters. It just shows you how good actors can be. You know, if he's yeah. such a dick off the camera and these people are putting these performances. Is pretty amazing. I guess Bill Murray basically was kind of trying to protect Wes Anderson from him, so he kind of okay. would would kind of stand up to 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 Hackman at times just to kind of prevent him. Like, so he would actually show up on set when uh, even when he wasn't uh, called for the set, he would show up just to make sure that Gene Hackman doesn't get out of line because he really hmm. respects Wes Anderson. So almost kind of like bodyguard ish. Um, while there was other sets with Gene Hackman where people would say like they basically would try to kind of play like be nice to Gene Hackman and try to kind of just be the in between mm -hmm. and, and more nice versus like Bill Murray was like fuck it like quit fucking with this guy like he's really good at what he's doing right. and, and you're just being an asshole to him so cool I have a question that's kind of directed to him and Owen Wilson as, as writers to this and it's more of a like I want more background on Pagoda and Royal um, so Pagoda is the, the, yeah, the helper yeah, yeah. and the whole story about him shanking him and then taking he, him he's a hired assassin and then he carried him to like, so that, that just didn't really make sense. It's like, why would he try to kill him? Then all of a sudden they didn't flesh out. Why did he try to save him? Why did they be, the, I'm I, assuming Hackman, you know, he's a talker. He exactly. probably talked him into too. like, you know yeah. what? I, I can make this right for you. Hey, look at, I'm going to make your life way yeah. better and, and probably made him feel bad for him somehow. Yeah. But then at, 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 towards he the end of the movie, he him. shakes him again. <laughs> you and son then, of a bitch. And then immediately, and then immediately, at least starts caring for him. Right. Yeah. It's just so weird. It just didn't make a lot of sense. And uh, uh, I, I, it made me laugh. Definitely amusing. But yeah. I, would, I would like to know more about them and uh, like why that happened. So. Uh, <laughs> one other question, and, and this was just looking through the trivia on IMDb. There was one thing that stood out to me that I didn't expect to see. So they talk about Mordecai, the hawk that uh, that it yeah. comes back and it has different colored feathers. It's like, oh, his feathers change. And they kind of actually worked it into the movie. <laughs> the reason the hawk has different colored feathers is because the original hawk was kidnapped during shooting and was held for ransom. What? And I would like to ask Wes Anderson, what? How did the hawk get kidnapped? And like, and who what was, was this ransom note? Like, like what, 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 what did they say? And so they, they ended up, uh, couldn't get him, uh, in time to be returned. So they had to get a different hawk that had different colored feathers and that's, they just worked it into the movie. <laughs> I love the like. I know sometimes, sometimes when people get really stressed, traumatic, tra yeah. traumatic, maybe their hair turns gray, it's molting. Yeah, yeah. that's so good. That is a crazy. Getting old. Nice. <laughs> Kidnapped hawk though, and uh, yeah, yeah. And like the word had to get ransom. out that like they're using this hawk on the set, and then but then so what happened to the hawk? They just said fuck it, and just let. They're just like them. we don't we don't negotiate with hawk terrorists. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I don't know. Like it's not in the budget, guys. Not in the budget. Yeah. We can't go over budget, so I don't know. Oh, I, that's that's not in the the trivia. So I and I didn't do any further research. I wonder so. what they're asking for. I wonder how much. Yeah, these, these are things I need to know. Brad, did you? Brad, did you share the the budget? Do we know what the budget was for Royal Tenenbaum? Yeah, it was 21. 21 million and uh, it grossed 71. Wow. Grossed wow. 71. That's, that's a money maker. Yeah. yeah. True. Um, I wonder whether so these uh, actors didn't take much money. I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, that's a, that the, the, the budget should have been higher given the acting talent. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's one of those things when those, those kind of early directors, they can kind of, you know, sometimes people just wanted to be in their movie and, and they know oh, right. the, this guy's next movie is going to be huge. So I'll even take a pay cut to work with him. And, I will, and, and on that parallel, right. You mentioned the Coen brothers, right? There's, there's some similarities there, right? Like they have some really good casts at times. And carryover actors that are in multiple that, movies, right. the Steve Buscemi's and, and, and folks yeah. like that. I mean, I think of like uh, Burn After Reading is the one that for some reason like jumps out at me, right? Like 
some pretty heavy hitting cast, and I bet you that that budget was not nearly what it should have been given the yeah uh, given the the size of the. That's an advantage of being one of those cool, artsy, critical favorite directors. Like I think yeah. you can kind of get people in, and they just they'll work for for scale or whatever. Lebowski, Fargo, like a bunch of Coen Brothers movies have those like sort of larger than life caricature characters. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Weird looking dudes that are just uh, that are all over those movies. So I think that's a good parallel. But I think that I think the Coen Brothers, in my opinion, sort of do it right in that it's yeah. still grounded in some bit of reality where Wes Anderson's just off in his own Wes Anderson land. So <laughs> certainly the Coen brothers do it right. And not only in the sense that they, they tend to, I mean, right is not the right word. They do it. They do it in a way that both creates more popular appeal, even though they're sort of still seen, I think is a little bit different, but also draws more awards and look right. Like yeah. Wes Anderson, considering the level of critical acclaim actually doesn't do particularly well in terms of big awards and, and the Coen brothers, both their act, the acting performances in their movies. And in you know, some cases like the other award categories, mm -hmm. they tend to do really well because I think they're not like quite so, you know, offbeat. And I think that that plays a little bit better with the idiots who are, voting on things mm -hmm. like academy awards well that's i would ask how how sad was he that gene hackman did not even get nominated for for best actor right for this like that's that's I, I don't know that to me is wild because he carries this movie and is so believable as this giant asshole and the ones that that got nominated that year um you had russell crowe for a beautiful mind sean penn i am sam will smith ali uh, and Tom Wilkinson in the bedroom, and the winner was Denzel for Training Day. So, so I'd say other than Denzel, that's actually a pretty weak setup. I mean, like not bad, but I mean, like yeah. I don't think that's a yeah. But those are all kind of dramatic movies. Um, Beautiful Mind, I Am Sam. You know, like this is kind of it's like a weird comp black comedy type yeah. feel. So it probably didn't get the respect. Yeah, the I could see that. Which, yeah, well, it yeah. makes sense. It's just like when I hear the list. I mean, Denzel and Training Days. Yeah, I'm not gonna get beat. I have no idea in the bedroom, Tom Wilkinson. I'm That's actually a really good movie. Tom Wilkinson's a fine in it, but like the movie is, it's heavy, heavy, but it's a good movie. And I think, I think Grand Budapest is the only Wes Anderson film that's been nominated for best picture out of, out of all of his ones. Yeah. Done. It's pretty wild. I don't know. I thought, uh, I, I still think it's one of the most iconic performances. Like, like mm -hmm. he's just so good as this perfect asshole that is endearing and he can make yeah. you love him at the same time, even though you're like, fuck this guy. But at the times he can just be kind of sweet and, and, and because, because you, you, you do love what he's doing with, with, uh, his kids, with, with, uh, Ben Stiller's kids, with the grandkids, with his grandkids yeah. cause he sees that that's not a way that kids are supposed to be raised. He's got them working out 16 times a week. <laughs> and, shit. and so he's like, no, yeah. you, we got to get these kids more rounded yeah. and, and experienced and see the yeah. world and see some shit. So you, you definitely, love him for that but you at the same time he's sitting there faking that he has stomach cancer yeah and, and oh he's terrible he's a and, horrible human being but, but, you but also him. doing you know and you know but you know also you realize you believe that he misses his family he realizes he fucked up yeah he, he lived a life that he's completely estranged from all his family and yeah. he i think he realizes he fucked up because he loves he, i love when he talks about like when he talks about like, oh just you know chopping it up and cutting it he's always talking yeah. about like being in the mix he likes to be in the gritty stuff and you know things are things are a little bit chaotic and wild like that just he thrives in that environment and obviously to be like the uh the patriarch of a family it, it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. coexist because you're going to be out there just running wild and yet you've got this family back home that you're just neglecting so kind of wild all right should we move on? Have Wes, uh, Wes, I'm so glad he got to join us finally. This was yeah, one of the better cool. uh, drinking with the directors where the director wasn't here. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and maybe uh, for one of his future movies, we'll get him here. So we will see in the future. Let's move forward. In a world where podcasts have become bland and stale, one podcast dares to stand above. Barrel Age Flicks Podcast. We're reviewing drinks. Breaking down movies. Busting each other's ball. And we're big in Hong Kong. Barrel Age Flicks Season 4. It's in the bottle. Yeah, yo. Available on Spotify, Apple Music, Audible, iHeartRadio, TikTok, YouTube, Patreon, and OnlyFans. Is it a one night stand? Or do you hit it with a shovel or take it home to mom and dad? It's like fuck, marry or kill. It's Shag Snack Body Bag. Shag snag body bag time. I should I should have changed it. What do you need? Little one night stand. Do you shoot him with a BB? 
Oh, yeah. I missed it. Shoot him with the BB. Which we, we were talking off air a little bit. Um, you want to talk about that now or do you want to go for it? Get, Drop it on. So in the in, there is the scene where, where Royal shoots. Um, is, is it Chaz? Yep. Yeah, Chaz. Chaz. And when they're on the same team and then it, he asks them to see it later in life. And, and that hand and the BB that's under the skin is actually Owen's brother. Andrew. Andrew, yep. who he actually shot when he was a kid oh wow yeah and so that uh, hand that was a legit bb yeah in andrew wilson's hand and andrew wilson is in the movie he's the uh the dad uh that 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 cuts off her finger mm-hmm. and he's also doing the the tennis uh play by play play by play he's yeah. one of the guys doing that so that's andrew wilson he's been in a few a few of the other uh, wes anderson movies as well yep Yep, yep, yep. Interesting. When I was when I was listening to the tennis commentary, I thought like maybe that's one of the Wilson brothers. Like it sounds that it has that like quality to the voice. He he and Owen talk a lot more alike than than Luke. Luke's kind of a yeah. little bit different, but yeah, Owen and Andrew kind of have the same kind of speaking. Yeah, he's style. he's the uh, Andrew is the uh, the coach in Rushmore where he's relocating the film or the, the the field the baseball field. Oh yeah, and, and he's like, what the hell are you doing here, man? <laughs> If you if you go back and listen to our commercial for this episode, that was Andrew Wilson who was uh, he was doing his brother's impersonation. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Glad we got him in here for that. Um, all right, shag snag body bag. Uh, what are we what are we shagging from this movie? Nate, let's start. What do you got for a shag? I'm shagging the backstory. So like we, you know we mentioned earlier that you want the backstory, but I love the opening sequence of this and giving the sort of like the run up. That's the part of the movie that I think that whole intro, yeah, the intro Alec where like, Baldwin exactly. Over. So like, you know, the, 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 the giving you the sort of context of the, the kids, what they did, how they got there, everything up to the sort of present day stuff. I uh-huh. just, you know, I dig it. I remind immediately jumped into the movie and remembered, right? Like that, that kind of sucks you in, in this movie for me. Um, so I don't know. I like that part a lot. Yeah, that so is- you, you just said to the present, what, what year do we think this movie is taking place in because I, I I started thinking about that for the first time really a lot on my on my last rewatch uh, just a few days ago and I was like is this supposed to be because at the end the 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 uh, tombstone says two thousand one okay but you can't imagine that Royal lived like ten more years or anything and then like so but it's definitely played like it's like early eighties like late seventies that's what it feels like they don't they, I mean they're all, all the old telephones and stuff there's no real technology in yeah, I kind of read it as more like early mid eighties um like his, his tennis style suits. yeah the track suits yeah I don't know I never really thought about a time period on this one it never really felt like a period piece um. I don't know. It, it, the, the gypsy cabs or something that stood out to me. That old ass cabs. Old ass cabs that are all banged up. Um, yeah. That, that was, that would be the only thing that the bus and like, yeah. I don't know. No, and you, when you look around at other people, nobody looks like they're that modern or like, I mean, 2001. Yeah. And if it's, it's supposed to be at the like late nineties, they definitely don't do that. I mean, I know, I'm sure that's probably intentional, but, but yeah, but, I don't know. Yeah, but I dude, I love that whole intro is is fantastic, and just with Alec Baldwin doing that, and then the talk about needle drops. We got needle drops coming up uh, for on, a, on a draft next week to kind of preview that a little bit. Um, the going into the Hey Jude, like the the na 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 part. Mm-hmm. That whole intro leading up to that is such a cool. Did, did we miss talk. Alec Baldwin uh, narrating here in our voiceover? I yeah. think I think I mentioned it as a null. Okay, right. I was gonna because it's a, it's a really good it, it one. is some good voiceover. Yeah, yeah, it really it does a lot. Zach, what do you got here for Shiag? I'm gonna shag um, Gwyneth Paltrow as like I think she's sort of like there's a whole like generation of young men that I think sort of fell for Margot in this movie, um, and lots of references to her, which I'll talk about later, and lots of references to her in pop culture, music, um, and she is really good. And I don't, she's not like one of my favorite actresses. I don't like her in a lot of stuff, um, but I think she, I, I actually, maybe I just don't like her like as a person yeah. per se, like as a real life person. But uh, in this, I think she's great. And uh, yeah, I think she she sort of embodies the super indifferent like indie chick, uh, which is like the opposite of the, like uh, what do we call it? The manic pixie dream girl. Like she's not that at all. She's the she's kind of the antithesis of that. Too cool for everything. And go ahead, Nate. Is this her best performance? 
it's my probably my uh, I mean, favorite performance. So, so hers, she's yeah. in she's in uh, Shakespeare in Love. I don't know if she won for that, but like that's that movie won. Yeah, um, and it's certainly great expectations. Like, great expectations. Seven. She's, Seven. I mean, a small role, but, but but great expectations. She's really great in, but it's she's a supporting, and I mean, I think she's good in it. But that movie's, I love that. I love the book. Her, her character like, and Great Expectations and Margot have a lot in common, though. That kind of like too aloof, cool for everybody, aloof, and like, but yeah. also like, you know, kind of artsy and like likes the the artist and and being a little bit weird and yeah. You know, it's 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 funny, and you guys will probably appreciate this, uh, Zach and Nate, as Marvel haters, because you know she's got a pretty big part in, in all in the Marvel Iron movies Man. and Iron yeah. Man and all the movies. And I've seen her interviewed a bunch of times, and every time somebody brings up anything about her character in any of the Marvel movies, she just gets kind of this blank look on her face. Yeah, she doesn't like, remember. Any I don't of it. remember any of that. And she's like, because she's just doing, she's just phoning in, she's doing her part, and just getting the hell out, cashing the paycheck. And, really? Yeah. Yeah, she, you, I've seen it multiple times. I knew he's like, "Hey, so and so with your your character." He's like, "Yeah, I don't remember that at all." Yeah, if you ever meet Gwyneth Paltrow, <laughs> definitely don't go there first because that's yeah. a quick way just to have her like be like, "Yeah, thanks." And this this isn't. And like, maybe that's. Why, go ahead. I was gonna say maybe that's why she's so good in this because she's too cool for school in real life too. Like maybe that's just her thing. Yeah, well, just like Gene Hackman's so good in it because he's a dickhead. Yeah, yeah, that's that's something to be said about that. I, sure. I also love the the little actress they got to play young Margot. Yeah, and, she's and great. She is fantastic, um, and, and I think she's she's perfectly cast in this and does a really really good job. Yep, Scotty, um, I'm gonna shag like little details, especially the 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 little details in um, Owen Wilson's apartment, the the artwork, <laughs> and the little stack of porno tapes. The uh, stack uh, of pornos, <laughs> little, yeah, the giant. It was like it was like <laughs> five tall and like seven wide. In the giant cardboard boxes that yeah. they would come in. Oh, oh my gosh! But uh, th- that artwork fucking kills me. That was one of the first things that that just in this movie grabbed me. It, they're so weird. Eli Cash is an interesting. Eli character. Cash is a very interesting character, but the, yeah, the details in that in that apartment just really kind of show you this guy's a mess and yeah. and what is going on with this guy. And I, I just love that shit. Um, my shag is, and I think this is Wes Anderson is the perfect shag because I, I passionately like love some of his stuff, but not all of it. Like it's, it's one of those things that there's certain things I just like, I will, I will go to war with like do Rushmore, um, and, and Royal Tenenbaums, like these are classics of cinema. And mm-hmm. then like his other stuff, there's stuff that I kind of like life aquatic. I was kind of like, it was good, but it was weird, a little bit, a bit, a little bit too much. And mm-hmm. then, um, like I said, some of the, the more recent stuff, uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox was was interesting going into an animation style with him and uh, and like just recently, like I said, I didn't like Asteroid City, but I do uh, the shorts that he's did the the Roll Doll shorts are are pretty awesome on mm-hmm. Netflix. So I don't know he's a, he's a good shag because when he's on, he is on fire. But yeah. some of his other stuff I can just kind of do without. Snags, snags. What do we got, Zach? So. I'll just, uh, I, I referenced before, like, the, the Margot character and, like, Wes Anderson stuff kind of being, like, in the zeitgeist and, like, kind of referenced in a lot of other pop culture. And the best example of that for me is this guy, uh, Richard Edwards, who's a singer-songwriter. He's been in a couple of different bands. He's one of my absolute favorite artists of all time, no, no hyperbole. And he was in it. His first band was called Archer Avenue, which is a shout-out to, uh, to Royal Tin and Bob's. And then... His second band is a band called Margo and the Nuclear So-and-Sos, which is just absolutely fantastic. So if you have Spotify out there, check out uh, check out Margo and the Nuclear So-and-Sos, uh, very first album called Animal. I guarantee you'll dig it. Check it out. Sweet. Um, I'm going to snag Wes Anderson montages and, and like he has this style that's so cool, but like when the whole, the whole, the montage of, of Royal mixing it up with the kids and like the doing the go-kart and the dog fighting and all that <laughs> shit. And he does this in most of his movies. And he also does the, the, the little, not really a montage, but like introducing characters like uh, her suitors. Like it shows the pictures that they're just kind of standing there posing of all the, the suitors that she had over the years. Yeah. Um, he does that in a lot of his movies and it's just a cool little <clears throat> uh, style and, and thing that he brings in his films. And I just fucking dig it. It's really, really cool. I, I'm going to snag uh, Gene Hackman and, oh, yeah. and Gene Hackman as an actor, he's been in a lot of great stuff. Um, but he, I think he's just so perfect for this role. And like, as we said many times here, I think it's cause he's, he's kind of just an angry person kind of a mean person in real life. So he kind of fits the role perfectly, but with enough charisma to make you like him. 
And, and I've done this with a few different movies, uh, Days of Thunder, uh, Robert Duvall, like mm-hmm. his, his pit chief. I, anytime somebody connects with my grandpa, my grandpa was a pretty big part of my life. And, uh, my grandpa was also known as kind of a, a cranky asshole. Like he was kind of a, <laughs> he could be kind of a jerk. And it's like, I think anytime I see characters that remind me of my grandpa, it really resonates with me. And I think Gene Hackman in this movie reminds me a little bit of my grandpa. Like he, he can put you in your place and in, in, in almost in a mean way, but at the same time, he's got kind of a loving heart and, and, uh, and you know he he liked his he loved his grandkids and and uh, but at the same time, I think that's why this character kind of it, it hits home for me is because I, it reminds me a little bit of somebody I I, I, I was very close with. I was telling Annika that story that you told on the pod about your grandpa and the the remote control cars. <laughs> <laughs> you got the worst one. I I told that at my cousin's wedding. My my cousin Wade, who was he was the lo- the youngest of the grandkids, and so he wasn't getting a remote control car. But he runs up. He's like, I like it. I, I, I told him like a, a, that was a story that I told at his wedding, just because I was like, you know what? He he was always the good natured little kid that right. would try to like. He didn't want to create the over. conflict. He wanted yeah. to smooth things over. And yeah, but that yeah, that was my grandpa too. Oh, he got the worst one. <laughs> Just always kind of being mean and had a, you know, you know, he didn't care about if people would get pissed off. So I'm going to snag Luke Wilson. Mm. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if how much I'm in the minority here, but I really like Luke Wilson. I think he's underrated. Yeah. Um, and tend to think that like, you know, he's not somebody that I would say has maybe huge range. But yeah. I think he, but I like what he's selling. Like I, I, I'm always, if he's in a movie, I'm more likely to want to watch it than if he's not. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, and he has some really, like he, he does some stuff that's pretty like, you know, Henry pool is here, right? Like some really weird offbeat ones that are really good. Um, and then, you know, he has like classic roles, like old school and stuff. I think this is yeah. his best role. Um, I th- especially for the intersection of, like a big, really like, you know, famous role with like some pretty darn good acting. Yeah. So I, I, I like him. I liked him in this. I thought he was, you know, he's really good. He's kind of a funny role. His meltdown on, on the tennis court is classic. <laughs> so great. Yeah. So anyway, and, and Id- idiocracy. I mean, he's the lead in that, but yeah. he's, he's, he's the appropriate lead because he is kind of the average guy. Like he's not super charismatic or anything. And so he fits for that role. But as far as like a dramatic role, like, I mean, that whole, just the looks in his face, like when, whenever, like when he punches the window and stuff and yeah. like, I mean, you can tell he's just going through the shit. And then obviously the, the suicide attempt, like that whole scene, I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's creepy Fantastic. and it's sad and it's, and obviously the music helps too. So it's, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. no, it's, it's, it, he, he's great in this. I, I really, I think he's for me, the, the most underrated probably. All right. I'm going to lead off. Real, with, sorry. Oh. That, real, that, that suicide scene made me it, as a question. Why does he say I'm going to kill myself tomorrow? And then he I tries to kill him, tries to kill himself right then. That, that was such a that was a has always been weird to me and stuck out as a as just a strange choice. I, I think maybe just the kind of almost the psychosis of somebody who's going through that. Like uh-huh. he's just like says it and then he's realized, wait, what, why, 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 why am tomorrow? I waiting? Like why not yeah. just right now? Like uh, yeah, that was the way I read it too. I don't know. But, it, but it's a very I caught that too. Yeah, yeah. It's really a interesting strange choice. He stood there for 24 hours and then, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to start off with the body bags here and, and Zach, I, I love that you shagged her because I'm going to body bag Gwyneth Paltrow almost for the exact reasons why you shagged her because she was kind of iconic for me, like great expectations and stuff. I kind of fell in love with her and then, uh, uh I always kind of had a thing for her, but as she kind of went on and became too much of a celebrity and then the whole goop stuff and like where you kind of get this feeling like she is elitist she really does think she's better than other people and she thinks that she knows all the answers and i i i I thought there's a side to her where it's like you could smoke a joint with her and like go skiing and have fun and and no but now it's like i think she just kind of like i think she's just kind of too good for everybody and 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 that definitely sours me on her and i'm like yeah fuck gwyneth paltrow no but i i as much as i was kind of in love with her in my my like teens early 20s like it's just not doing it for him anymore i'm like I, she's I'm over definitely her. wheelhouse for you and i now that i hadn't really thought about yeah it, i know. mean the the, the kind of the, the tall skinny blonde but the uh the, the the whole story with her ski thing if you guys didn't follow that kind oh, of yeah. like like she she uh, uh she ran into a guy and like the guy tried to say like later on he had so many like back problems and this and that and tried to sue her and that the whole court saga of like so, 
uh, her just like viciously attacking the dude, like in, in court and stuff and, and just being herself. And, uh, it was kind of wild. And I don't think they ended up awarding him, uh, him any money. So, wow. so she won that case, but she again, hit him. Yeah. yeah. But, and it, but it was like the most, like, absolutely like, Oh, the most elite resort in, in Aspen type thing, like, mm-hmm. Oh, or, or Vail or whatever. I don't know where, wherever they were, but it was just like, it, it was just so pretentious and, and, and rich and just dumb that it was, it was kind of hilarious. Yeah. Oh, man, I, I, re- I really feel like torn about this. I think this is a dick move, but I'm going to body bag Owen Wilson. And wow. I, I don't like him <laughs> as an actor. Really? I, I, oh, that's the hot take. I don't like him as an actor. I don't like him in anything he's ever in as an actor. Dude. I, I, I don't. Cars, bro? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> wedding Crashers? You don't like Wedding, wedding Crashers? I don't. Ooh. I, I mean, I'm, I like the movie, and I'm not saying, like, there are roles where he does less to take away from it. Uh-huh. But I think what it is is, like, he, I mean, you know, for me, he is the ultimate, always plays the same character. Always oh, yeah. And I mean, yeah. even more, like, he's the poster child for this for me. And so even more than like Vince Vaughn or any of the other, you know, Will Ferrell, like, like he's the like ultimate, no range, no variation. And I, I, it's a dick movie. I mean, like he's, he's obviously talented. He, I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I have a minority opinion and I don't really want to shit on anybody, but man, like I just don't like him and I, and I don't like him. And actually in this movie, in some ways, like maybe it works better than others because he actually is a little unlikable in yeah. a certain way. He plays that well. But even in doing that, it's very similar. It's almost like I'm like, oh, this is all the writing. Like you, you know, all the work is being done in the writing here, and of course he writes it. So part of it. So like maybe I'm, you know, but I, but the acting part of it, I just don't. He, I, he's just not my guy, man. And maybe especially because he's had a bigger career than than his brother. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, why? If you look at Hansel, the male model, <laughs> his character from uh, Zoolander. What's it called, guys? Zoolander. From Zoolander, it's almost the exact same character, down to wardrobe, that he is as Eli Cash in uh, Tenant Bombs. I mean, <laughs> yep. they wear the exact same shit and act the exact same way. So that's a good call, I guess. Has has he had like one? Because almost every actor you think of, like like a Vince Vaughn, he's done some some serious yeah. weird roles that are just completely yeah. off cast of what he I usually is. I don't. Has know. Owen Wilson done that? Does he have a movie where, or is he just like fuck it? I'm just going to be myself. And 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 is it is it an intentional choice or is it he's just not a good actor? I mean, I guess that's the big question. Is well, in another Wes Anderson movie, uh, Life Aquatic, he he's kind he's got a little accent kind of and he's he's that's I, that's about as deep as he gets like he throws a little accent and but kind of acts the same he's kind of aloof and kind of simple so that's a bad example but that's the only th- thing i can think of where he actually at least he tries an accent in that one i never saw behind enemy lines so i don't know if he's like it, i mean as a soldier is he he's any just, good he's or? just him kind of yeah i, I don't rem- i don't know i did I've... see that movie it's actually pretty decent gene so. hackman in that one too yeah he, he doesn't seem like the type but i mean he actually had some serious drug issues and yeah. and uh and like almost died. So, I mean, he's, he's had some, he's got some edge in real life. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. In in what way, in what way does he not seem like the type? He seems like the poster child for having some sort of fucking stimulated addiction or fucking heroin or something. You don't think so? I I feel like he's so laid back. He just seems chill. Like every situation he's going to be kind of chill. Like I'm, I'm kind of just cool with everything. I don't know. Like, I don't see it. I, I don't know. Interesting. But Loki, if you haven't seen Loki, he was actually pretty terrific in that, but he's playing himself. Like he's right. absolutely himself, but he's he's good at it. He's really good at it. He plays himself really well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zach, what are you body bagging? There's a there's a thing that happens in a lot of nineties TV shows, early TV shows, and in this, where someone is smoking a cigarette inside of an enclosed room and then they take a tiny fan and spray a little bit of uh, air freshener. And no one is supposed to notice that they fucking reek of cigarettes. Like, yeah. it is the most annoying thing to me. Like, 11 years, she lives in that house, and no one walked into that bathroom and was like, oh, it smells like a fucking ashtray in here. Like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't buy it. That that's, my, a, that's my body bag. That's a good body bag. It's so funny because that has bothered me every time, but it, and it kind of just it leaves my mind. The minute you brought it up, I was like, oh my God, that bothers me so bad. I, I, yeah, I acknowledge that every single time. I'm like, really? That's all you have to do? <laughs> Obviously, people that's have not great. lived around smokers yeah. before. Um, 
as I was watching this, for some reason, I I was just curious to see how old Gene Hackman was when, when they did this. I was just kind of curious. And he was like, I think he was 71 when they filmed this. And so I found the site and it oh, showed, wow. showed all their, all their ages. And like, you know, uh, I forget if it was Ben Stiller or Luke Wilson. One of them was like 29. I think Ben, Ben Stiller was like 32. And, and so like, like a lot younger than I was expecting. And then I just got sex. I'm, I'm going to body bag the fact that I'm almost as old as Angelica Houston and Bill Gene Murray Hackman. were when they were in this. <laughs> Not Gene Hackman, you fucker. <laughs> but I am literally, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a year away from how old Bill Murray was when he made this. Wow. And he, to me, he just looks so much older. But apparently, you guys are looking at me now, going, you know, that's what you look yeah. like. You the look- gray beard, like I yeah. mean, he's, he's got the exact same thing going on. I was like son of a bitch. But think about how much life he has still had since then. So you've got a long ways to go, my brother. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Almost makes me feel better. All right, folks. That's we actually are- a great take, Brad. I love that. That's a great take. Just think about how many years you got left. Because look how old Bill Murray is now. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. This is a positive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Let's move on to our, our next category. Crackle, Pluto, HBO, Fine Anime, on Crunchyroll, Pika, Hulu, Disney, Netflix, Disney, Sling TV, Shutter, Shutter, Boobo. What the fuck is Boobo? I'm sure it'll cause a sensation. It's a streaming recommendation. All right, streaming recommendation. We are trying to offer you some uh, movies that remind us a little bit of uh, Royal Tenenbaums or, you know, something associated with it, something uh, maybe not at all like it, but it brings up something. So what do we got? It, it's, it's weird because when I think about Wes Anderson movies, I have a hard time recommending them to other people because, like, I just don't know if people are going to get it or like it or not. But the point of this whole thing is if you like this movie – then you'll probably odds are you're going to like other movies. So I'm going to recommend another Wes Anderson movie. And I would say life aquatic with Steve Zissou, but it seems like most people don't really like it. I love that movie, but it took me a few watches and then it t- also took other people that liked it to talk about scenes with, to like it more. Okay. You know, you know, with your, when you're through buddy, you start throwing scenes around or whatever. So, but what I'm going to just take Grand Budapest, Budapest Hotel and recommend that instead, because I think there's a better chance of people liking that than Life Aquatic. Grand Budapest Hotel is fantastic. Ray Fiennes is unbelievably amazing in that. He's so fun. His character is so interesting. And so there's so many lines that are just so funny and Jeff Goldblum's in it. The amazing cast, just like always. And the the set pieces are incredible. Um, and it's just a fantastic film. So check out Grand Budapest Hotel. I dig that. Um, I guess I might as well do it before somebody else does it. I'm I'm going in that same vein. If you liked Royal Tenenbaums, it's I I, I it'd be very weird to like Royal Tenenbaums and then not also like Rushmore because they've mm-hmm. got the same feel. Um, you basically take the Gene Hackman character and kind of put it at, uh, Bill Murray is kind of that guy a little bit in, uh, in Rushmore, um, a weird love triangle between an old man, uh, like a teacher in like her like twenties or thirties and then a high school kid. And it's kind of a unexpected love triangle, but it works for the movie without being like super, super creepy. And, uh, I think you would enjoy it if you liked Royal Tenenbaums, but that is not streaming anywhere, so you're gonna have to rent it, just like the old BBK days. Just, just like I just forgot that I didn't mention that Grand Budapest Hotel. You could rent it on Apple. There you go. <laughs> I, I would have liked to go with Rushmore, but I knew it was gonna get taken. Um, so I took one. I, I want to make a recommendation that has a couple of connections. It's called the Zero Effect. It's from the late '90s, and it's Ben Stiller and Bill Pullman. Um, and it's like Bill, the, Pullman, the lesser Bill P the lesser of the Bill P's. Um, and, uh, it's, he's like a private detective and, uh, Ben Stiller is like his assistant. Who's kind of the face. So he's kind of an eccentric. And so it's kind of quirky. It's a, it like has been Stiller a little bit of a quirky movie, not nearly, you know, sort of Wes Anderson quirky, but it's an offbeat for sure. And I remember it's been a long time since I've seen it, but I remember really, really liking it. Um, and kind of, it really, it was under the radar. So I would say if you're in the mood for kind of a, 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 a wacky, not well, not wacky, but like a little bit of a, like a dark comedy dramedy, um, detective, private detective type, type uh, movie with Ben Stiller. This is the one. So you can't, you have to rent it somewhere. It's cheap though. What was it called? The zero effect. Zero effect. Yeah. yeah. Zach, you got something? If you're listening to a movie podcast, 
there's no way you haven't seen the two movies I'm going to talk about, but uh, Napoleon Dynamite obviously makes me think of uh, of Wes Anderson. So that was my pick. But what I what I really am like thinking about now, and this sort of gets into alternate endings a little bit, is like I wonder what movie we could do in the Wes Anderson style that we really like. And the one that comes to mind because of the Elliott Smith connection is, can you imagine, I think I would hate it. Can you imagine what's your favorite Damon movie? Um, Goodwill hunting as uh, Wes Anderson and vice versa, like a sort of like real life Goodwill hunting style film, but it's Royal Tenenbaums. Like you take Royal Tenenbaums and take away all the Wes Anderson, this, but the same story. And uh, and then and then you you sort of flip those two movies around. I think I would like the Royal Tenenbaums real life sort of uh, sort of in the style of that. Uh, I would think I would like that. I don't know if I would like uh, the other one in the Wes Anderson style. I don't know what your thoughts are. I think you're on drugs. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck he just said. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> You want me to do Royal <laughs> Tenenbaums? Did he just say like about three different things and just, actually, like, just melted together? And- <laughs> actually, I, the idea that like what Wes Anderson, I mean, it's hard for me to want anyone to do anything with Goodwill Hunting because it's so perfect. But I am intrigued by the idea of Wes Anderson directing Goodwill Hunting. But where the documentary coming out? That's like, exactly my point. No, there's no documentary. He said in real life, though. Like I thought he means like in the style of like oh. the real life as opposed to the caricature. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. That's yeah, what yeah, I think yeah, where yeah, I got yeah. like like stri- take, taking taking Royal <laughs> Tannenbaum Tannenbaum straight ahead. Now, look, my like, my brain goes a million places all the time. At, at one point, I could have sworn I thought he was talking about Matt Damon playing Wes Anderson in a biopic or something. I so, thought that's so, what oh he was going God. with that. So actually, let, 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 let me let me challenge that for a second, Zach. So we haven't talked about this at all, and I don't even really want to. Um, but like, <laughs> the are we going to call it incest? The incest incest relationship in Royal Tenenbaums between uh, the two between Richie and Richie and, and, and Margot. Okay, it somehow avoids any kind of like real heavy. I it, it, I don't want to say it feels okay, but like it it somehow feels slightly less out of place because of the way that Royal Tannenbaum's play, you know, because Wes Anderson's style is such a caricature. That does not play as well, I think, if you have a straight ahead version of the movie. Like I think that's it, what I, I th- think it would be awesome. I think it I think it overwhelms a lot of the like you're able to focus on other things in this movie because it's Wes Anderson doing weird stuff. And I think without the Wes Anderson, that is like the whole movie. Well, both, both Royal and Eli are the ones who reference to it. Eli tries to be a little bit more like coy about it, but Royal's just straight up. She's your sister. (laughs) He's like, well, it's still, it's still frowned upon. Right. (laughs) It's illegal. Anyway. So all of your faces, when I finally stopped talking there, I was like, wow, am I not making any sense at all? And apparently I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I, like a I fucking love it. <laughs> Scott, Scott and I kind of looked at each other for a second. <laughs> I was just glad you said it first. <laughs> I, 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 I got it, drink, buddy. I drink got cough it. syrup. <laughs> Thank you, bro. And Gatorade Pedialyte. Um, all right. Well, Is that everybody's recommendations? Let's, yeah. let's yeah. move on. We've got uh, one more category here. No jet watch for Maverick, mixed up on that goose stick. Iceberg list Titanic, Leo's drawing that nude shit. Jim fucks Nadia like we all thought he should. Ricky and Doughboy get the fuck out the hood. Luke hooks up with Leia just like he's intending. It's time for a reshelf and alternate endings. All right, alternate endings and reshelves. I, I'm going to start with the reshelf because we, we usually don't. We got a lot of alternate endings a lot of times, but a, a reshelf. How many of you guys have seen Knives Out, Glass Onion? Mm-hmm. Okay, so oh, I'm yeah. thinking this movie lends itself perfectly to a Ryan totally. Johnson kind of Knives Out type mystery because you've got a bunch of interesting characters. If Royal dies in the house uh-huh. and then all of a sudden you bring in, I forgot what the fuck his name is, uh, from from the, the Knives Out movies, whoever uh, oh, uh, Daniel Craig is. James whatever. Bond. Yeah. I forgot what his name. Uh, it's uh, d- d- it's a, d- d- a southern Louisiana style name. What the fuck is it? 
I don't remember. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so he comes into the house and you've got these quirky characters that all have some motive and stuff. And uh, I think it would be fun if they're trapped in the house and he's got to figure it out and you're going through all the different characters. They're all got their own little personalities. Right. And I think it lends itself perfectly to like like a her, murder her, her mystery. Her missing finger really wasn't that, yeah. that story. There's a, another reason for a missing finger. You've got, yeah, a lot of interesting uh, backstories. The, the, the murder mystery uh, it would be a lot of fun because like you, you wouldn't really know who, wait, who could it be? It could be a lot of different people. Knives Out is one that we didn't mention. And I would say that's a very similar, like that's one of the closer styles, right? Like mm-hmm. this feel, Knives Out feels a lot like yeah. a Wes Anderson. Like you could imagine that Wes Anderson could have directed Knives Out and it would have been similar even right. if the coloring is not the same. Right. But like the editing Especially style, the, the caricature characters. Yeah, the second one, it's a little more over the top. Um, I actually think yeah. I, the first one, though, in certain ways, like the second one doesn't have quite the same like cuts that the that the um, first one does. Benoit Blanc. The first one. That's his name, Benoit The first Blanc. one's a better movie. Oh, by a lot. The first one's a better movie it's for sure. Close. The second yeah. one is more Wes Anderson. Two was fun. Yeah, I think. I think Glass Onion was. I haven't fun. seen that one yet. Oh, yeah. it's 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 pretty fun. Good. I like that though. Yeah. So that's that's my reshelf. Uh, we we turn it into the the Knives Out style murder mystery, yeah. and I think it just it works perfectly with all the different characters that are in the house. Uh, yeah, I don't really have any alternate endings or, or reshelves, but like I would love to see um, like a prequel. Um, I would love to see the story of of, of Royal and Bagoda and and the, that whole crazy adventure and just just young Royal. Like doing some shit. Ooh, you know? Know. What the hell was he doing in India? Like, like yeah, we gotta find out. Yeah, like, there's a lot with his life and and uh, snake fights or something. I don't yeah, know. so uh, that's that's. What I, I like that. Say. Yeah. So I liked. It's the, the, I have one little tiny like like piece I'd like to change that I think I thought about at some point and couldn't remember if this is the way it went. But I like the idea that Royal actually did have stomach cancer. Okay. So like, and in some ways that makes it. Like, so along the lines of what Zach said, there's a, the one maybe criticism I have of the, the structure of the, or the, of the overall kind of plot and script is it does feel like the conclusion of, of the transformation of Royal and the acceptance of that by the family is almost too fairy tale. Um, and this sort of goes along with the idea that, that, you know, it's a caricature and everything, but it, it's like, it, it doesn't have quite enough bitterness still mixed into it at the end. And I think it would have been more palatable for me if, if it really is that he's dying, right? Like that it's not that, that like he, he has this recognition and is like kind of selling out all the way because he knows so that, you know, like he's actually, you know, they, they, they find everything's the same in the sense that they find the Tic Tacs and like all that stuff's fabricated, but that's all fabricated because like he needs to sell it to them to try to get them to let him back in. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he's not actually getting any treatment for it. Like he just, he, he knows that it's, it's, it's so, so he's not like, that's all, those are all props. Um, you know, to try to get them to believe right. that he's dying because like he wants them, he does want them to come back around and he does need it because he's nowhere to live. But I like the idea. And he, you know, he goes back and forth with Angelica Houston where he's like, no, I'm not dying. Well, I am dying. And I liked the idea that like he really was dying and he, but he was just trying to figure out like, he's trying to soften the He's bit. trying to figure out how to, how best to like get her to like accept what he's trying to do. Well, the, the only thing he does once they find out that he was faking cancer, which you would think would be like the ultimate final fuck you. Like yeah. we don't, right. and he gives everybody a little story at the end. Like as he's leaving, he kind of has like his little uh, kind of heart to heart with everybody. Hey, take care of those boys. Like let them, and he has with, uh, uh, with Henry, he has like a little kind of like, I kind of like you. Or maybe no, maybe it does that actually. Because the only thing he does when he brings the divorce papers, is that the only thing he does to that get redeems, himself yeah, I redemption wise? Yeah, I never really cons- thought about like what does he, does he do enough to get himself back in, and why would they take him back in? Yeah, because because he does realize himself that he actually meant that he, you know, that the, what he, he said at the, the end. Boys. Yeah, well, but, yeah, but that's because he's been invited to the wedding, and is the only reason he got invited oh, to the right. wedding is because he brought the divorce papers. Well, no, but I mean, he he has the like well, but I mean, I don't know about the wedding, but like he has the you notice he has the the meal with Margot. And he buys her the ice cream, and he, and he, it's very subtle, but he introduces her as his daughter, not his adopted daughter. And like, it's clear that in that moment, right? Like, as little as it is, she, like, she, he finally accepts her in a way that, like, she feels, and mm-hmm. then, like, it, it be, you know, grudgingly kind of like starts to feel, you know, like, 
So I'm not, I'm not saying, and he saves the he saves the boys, right? At and the wedding, that's at the wedding. But he's at got invited. Like I guess my yeah. question is like, why did he get invited to the wedding? Only because he gave the divorce. He granted papers? the divorce. Yeah. But I mean, oh. I guess that you could say, yeah. Like I mean, kind of like you're saying. I mean, he everybody starts to realize, well, in his old his own fucked up way, this was his way to try to get himself back in the family. And as as dumb and stupid as it was, at least he was trying. Mm-hmm. And yeah. anyway, um, I, I just want I, I I had the thought that like that for me would have like created a more convincing like you know plot tie that that i think i, I missing. I do, I do love the the line though after they realize he's a fraud he's like i do have high blood pressure though <laughs> <laughs> like he's, he's still clinging he's still or, trying. Or, or with Richie where he's like but i'm gonna live <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah upside <laughs> But but the, the, my my favorite line we didn't really get and there's some great lines and the, my favorite oh, is when yeah. he's talking to Henry like where he finally kind of says like he likes it, you know I've been an asshole for about as long as I can remember <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of my thing <laughs> <laughs> that's so great so I don't know uh, it, it, or I mean you know maybe he didn't die at the end of the movie maybe he never dies maybe he never dies hmm. why would that be does it come out of the coffin. Maybe he's vampire, and all of them are half vampires, and that's why they're so surly. And Except kind Angelica of and uh, Henry, Margot, and Margot. Oh, Margot's adopted. Yeah, she's not. Oh, and so they all eat them, it, or or Margot fights them with her wooden finger. It's a, like the wooden stake. Oh, she sharpens it right through the heart. <laughs> and maybe that's why she that's has the wooden perfect. finger is because she keeps she can them at sense bay. It. She knows they all know that like that she'll you know, mess with her because she'll yeah. finger stab them. <laughs> <laughs> when you get that kind that. of when you get that kind of insight folks on bbk it's you know because we're getting towards the end of an episode uh, right if even if it's the morning we're not drinking hard like i, I don't know the, the giddiness and the silliness comes out at the end so yeah, yeah. all right folks uh zach anything to add Richelle, for or alternate ending there i can ramble some more with another confusing story that you guys won't get but I'll have to <laughs> what, are, what are we doing next week Next week, uh, this is this is a long time coming. I've been uh, the BBK guys in our little text threads. I've been trying to push for this for a long time for a few different movies. We're finally going to do the most memorable needle drops in <laughs> film. So that time when that music comes on and the the music just hits perfectly. It's a song you probably know, or maybe it's a song you haven't heard before, but it's it's something that just fits with the scene. It gives you the feels. You you get you know you get a little goosebumps maybe when you when you think of that scene or that or that scene comes right. To your mind when you when you hear that song so needle drops it's, in movies it's a deep category man I, yeah. there's like four that have ever happened <laughs> right that i can think of yeah it's gonna be fun <laughs> all right folks and we might even have a special guest judge uh, uh showing up uh, a fan favorite somebody who's been on the pod many times before and i'm looking forward to it so uh tune in next week uh this week show up friday night get to the last call tap room oakdale First Street, it's going to be delicious beer. We'll probably be there at around five, five thirty. Yeah, yeah. And it's, rolling in, we'll be, we'll, there'll be some music, some live music yeah. played throughout. It's a Friday. It's a great way to end the work week with a uh, some great music, some great food, and some delicious beer that yeah. we helped brew. Uh, thanks to Cat and Walter who were a part of it. Um, it's going to be in cans. It's going to be on draft. It's BVK IPA three draft day. Draft- Who's the food truck, bro? Oh, a live drafting oh, right there we're gonna get in live studio. Draft oh, shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, that's how, when we first pour it and we do our first toast, you better drop that scotch. I'm, right. I'm waiting for I it. Uh, Zach, what you got? Who's the food truck that's coming? The food truck. If you want to look them up on the socials, it's called Da Fork in the Road. D-A, Da Fork in the Road. Um, they've got some delicious eats. So you're going to get some some burgers, some fries, and some uh, uh, you know some different stuff going on. So bring your uh, uh, your credit cards so you can chalk up, uh, just like Zach did last time, You know, put about four or $500 on the, uh, the old credit card to purchase <laughs> copious amounts of uh, BBK IPA. And I've used copious now, I think twice. Yep. You can that's, also- be, It's too, too many. You can that's be like, be like my brother and leave the- credit card behind and then i'll drop a 25 percent tip on there for him when i there you pick go. it up for him there you go and, and yeah tip your 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 folks that are, uh, it's going to be a, a pretty busy night make sure you do tip uh, all the the folks working there because jake and, and his team do a great job to to accommodate us and we're so glad that they're bringing us back for the the third edition and uh, the third release party so see you friday night check us out on the socials um you know if you if you've never left a review and you're like man i've been listening to these guys for a while i probably owe them a review you or something or, yeah, i owe cause... you know at least telling somebody about this pod and, and sharing it around you probably do owe us i mean 
I mean, we're not going to come to your house and collect yet, but for right now, you probably should, uh, you know, do something for us since we've been doing some things for you for a few years now. All right, folks, check us out Friday. See you later. Draft next week. Oh, bye. Bye.